let me thank uh, Cambridge University Press for organizing this webinar and for giving us the opportunity to share with you, um, you know, some of the main arguments, results, and ideas behind uh, becoming free, becoming black, and also to some degree some of the process that um, through which we ended up producing this book, um, a book that um, I have uh, written with my colleague, friend, and collaborator, Professor Ariela Gross. Now, this is a book that tries to offer a new look um, at an old question about the development of different uh, and differential racial regimes in the Americas between the 16th and the 19th centuries. There is, during the period um, in which the enslavement of people of African origin and African descent characterized many societies uh, in the region, including, of course, the three societies that we look at in our book. Now, that question asks why a shared experience of racism and plantation slavery ended up producing racial regimes uh, in which, by the mid-19th century, the social implications and opportunities uh, associated with blackness were fundamentally different. Um, this is a question that guided previous generations of comparativists, people like Frank Tannenbaum, Stanley Elkins, Herbert Klein, Carl Degler, Harry Hepping. And it is a concern that somehow lived on in the comparative literature on the US and South Africa, in the scholarship of people like Stanley Greenberg, John Sell, uh, Ariela's mentor and professor, George, uh, George Fredrickson, uh, one of the great comparativists uh, of all times, and Anthony Marx. Perhaps the most recent and remarkable effort in this tradition is Robert Cottrell's book, uh, The Long Lingering Shadow. So there is, you know, we are part of a, of a, of a fairly long and fairly distinguished um, uh, uh, tradition of scholarship. But our starting point is, is very different from that of these authors. Um, due to the fact that studies of slavery, race, and legal systems, has ex these studies have experienced a remarkable growth over the last uh, few decades, um, about three decades or so. These studies, in which uh, both Ariel and I have participated, favor the analysis of how subaltern actors, including enslaved people, and free blacks participated in the development of legal regimes on slavery and freedom and contributed to um, the development of uh, you know, vernacular interpretations and customs uh, that help uh, shape legal systems on race and slavery on the ground. For this new cultural and legal history um, of slavery and race, the law is not associated so much with us as it was for previous comparativists with a particular text or a particular statute, but with conflicts, uh, social conflicts in which different actors and different interpretations and visions struggle to gain legitimacy and official sanction. Or to put it another way, our comparative effort is anchored in the boom in the legal cultural historiography of slavery from below. We are we have been beneficiaries of that historiography, and we and we build from that historiography. Now, precisely because this historiography has grown so much, both in the United States but also in Latin America producing the sort of uh, empirically grounded synthesis that we ended up producing was quite quite the challenge. Um, this is the sort of project that almost by definition requires uh, something that historians rarely do, which is collaborative research and collaborative uh, writing. Like many other projects, ours, ours uh, started uh, almost by chance uh, in 2002. Um, and it doesn't mean that we started in 2002. It just, it, it, this is just a foundational moment, but it doesn't mean that we started the project then. But in 2002, Ariel and I met each other at a, at a panel on law and slavery at the annual conference of the American Society of Legal History, a panel that had been organized, and not by chance, by our colleague and mutual friend, uh, Rebecca Scott. And it was a panel designed precisely uh, to foster collaboration and exchange across national boundaries and across linguistic uh, barriers. Now, we arrived at that panel from rather different personal and professional trajectories. Uh, we had just both published our first books, 
a real book about the history of everyday law of slavery in the U.S. Deep South, and me a book on uh, race inequality and politics in 20th century Cuba. So two very different books, but they were both out by the time we met each other. And then we were both working on our second books, which were as different from each other as the first ones, if not more. But along the way, and we met frequently uh, in the subsequent years, we discovered several important commonalities that made becoming free, becoming black possible. And now retrospectively, we, we think even possible. Uh, regardless of topic, place, and period, questions of race, enslavement, discrimination, and the law were always at the center of our intellectual work and our scholarly attention. We also shared similar understandings uh, of the law, of the law uh, in the way this new historiography has understood it as a space for conflict uh, and not just a, a statutes that need to be enforced or not enforced in practice. Uh, and we were both interested not only in understanding how enslaved people may have used the law to their advantage, but also how in the process they advanced their own understandings of rights and fairness. In other words, we were both interested in their fundamental but frequently overlooked uh, intellectual contributions. At the end of the day, however, I truly believe that what made this book possible first and foremost uh, was a shared conviction, shared concern uh, concerning the devastating effects that race as a category of difference and racial ideologies continue to have uh, on our societies um, across the Americas. This is something that we both experienced growing up, I realized in the US, myself in socialist Cuba, and it's something that we talked about frequently during those years. It is a concern, it is an indignation uh, that recent events of brutal and brutally public racialized violence, not only in the US, by the way, but also across Latin America, have made uh, painfully uh, current. When we began writing this book, uh, we did not expect the book to feel so current, even the, the events that have been happening, again, not only in the US, but across the Americas in the last few months. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, give the virtual floor to my colleague and friend, Ariel Agros. Thank you very much uh, to Alejandro and also uh, to Cambridge uh, for publishing our book and for giving us a chance to talk about it with you. Um, I am going to attempt uh, to show us a few images um, and, uh, and to talk uh, just for a bit uh, about um, the three periods we cover in this book, because I think one of the the key aspects uh, for us of tracking racial formation and the law, and one that we felt distinguished this work from some earlier comparative works, was the effort to really look at change over time. Um, so let me uh, see if I can share my screen with you. Um, uh, hang on. So I'm going to start uh, in, oh, that did not. You're sharing it already. I am, but I, but it looks to me like I didn't change. Did the, ch did the screen change on your camera? Like no, it, your, did. it did. It did not. not. It's still on the book cover. Now it did. I did. Okay, great. Um, the book is divided into three periods, um, and we start, in the, in the earliest uh, moment of uh, uh, colonization and, um, and uh, settlement of the three places that we're looking at, where across the Americas, slaveholding elites began the process of legal race making almost as soon as they arrived in the colonies. But the Spanish who arrived in Havana had a head start, unlike the British and the French, by the time they arrived in Havana, 
Spanish colonists could draw on Iberian social and legal precedents regarding enslaved Africans. Um, and they could copy, for example, local ordinances from Sevilla restricting the market activity of black women or ordinances that conflated los negros with esclavos or subsumed um, the category of people known as negros in the same legal regime as all enslaved people. Um, so they already had a template for racial distinctions in the law. Likewise, the French arrived in Louisiana in the early 18th century with decades of experience enslaving Africans in the Caribbean. They brought with them a code of laws regarding enslavement of Africans that had already been shaped by the French experience of enslavers in the Caribbean. So you can see here the Louisiana Code Noir of 1724, um, by its very name connecting slavery to race, um, uh, builds on uh, and uh, incorporates even modifications based on the experience and anxieties of the owners of enslaved people in the French Caribbean. For example, they add a ban on interracial marriage um, and, and new police regulations adopted in Louisiana also uh, introduce uh, legal handicaps applying to all people of African descent, like deference to white people um, and so forth. Um, in Virginia, uh, the colonists also created a racist legal regime associating blackness with slave status, but they did so more slowly and more fitfully because of the lack of precedence in English law concerning slavery um, and the lack of experience in uh, the African slave trade. And, um, and so there was a level of, of uncertainty on some basic questions, like how slave status would be transmitted from parent to child, whether Christian baptism was compatible with enslavement, none of which posed any serious problems or logistical quandaries to uh, uh, Iberian slaveholders. Um, and, uh, and so in 17th century Virginia, there developed a significant population of people who had gained their freedom, especially on the Eastern shore of Virginia, pictured here. And, um, and people and individuals in the 17th century who, whose lives would appear remarkable from the perspective of even 50 or 100 years later. So for example, Anthony Johnson, who's relatively well known in early American history, who owned himself uh, enslaved uh, quite a few people, owned significant amount of uh, land and property, uh, one uh, was frequently in the county courts and, and won lawsuits against white men. Um, Elizabeth Key, who and had a white father, um, even though her uh, even though her mother was African descended, she promised to return to England with her father after gaining her freedom, but instead married her white attorney and stayed in Virginia. By the time Anthony Johnson died in 1670. Things are already beginning to change in Virginia, such that um, his estate uh, essentially returned to the Commonwealth of Virginia rather than going to his sons because he was, quote, a Negro and therefore an alien. Um, one key difference, however, by uh, the first quarter of the 18th century um, between Cuba on the one hand, Virginia and Louisiana on the other was the right to bestow freedom on an enslaved person and therefore the right of an enslaved person to claim freedom is cut back severely in both Virginia and Louisiana by the first quarter of the 18th century, um, but not in Havana, not in Cuba. And because of that like, legal uh, lack of, of restriction, um, we see in Cuba the development of an institution um, the, or a practice uh, known as coartacion that doesn't uh, really have um, a, a direct equivalent uh, 
in uh, in either Virginia or Louisiana. And it's, a, uh, I think, a, an amazing case study of the ways in which enslaved Cubans are able to carve out over time significant legal rights for themselves. Um, so uh, the way this works, uh, at one example that we talk about um, in the very uh, introduction to the book is the enslaved woman, Juana, who purchases her freedom um, in exchange for 300 pesos, but she doesn't do it in a single transaction. She pays half the price, and in return, her owner issues a notarized receipt that declares um, that uh, he is, if she pays the remainder, he is obligated by law to concede her freedom. She is now coartada. She has now uh, 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 paid part of her price. And that means she can only be sold or transferred or mortgaged to someone else on conditional terms. Not only that, if Juana wanted to find a new owner, she could, uh, or, or this practice develops, that she can carry paper that uh, known as pedir papel to another owner. And if the owner pays the remainder of her price, uh, if that person pays the remainder of her price, the owner must sell her. So that's one of the practices that enslaved people begin to push on to expand the meaning of uh, coartacion. The contract Juana signed also specified that any buyer, quote, must grant her half the time that belongs to her and discount it from her price. In other words, she owned a portion of her labor because she had paid a portion of her price. Um, that was a very contested right um, in, uh, in Cuba, but it was one that enslaved people pushed uh, and, and uh, tried to use to expand um, their rights uh, of claiming freedom. Now, in the age of revolution, which we mark from the 1760s to the 18 to 1830, our second period, um, the world turns upside down. Um, and, and most important there is, is uh, the uprising and uh, an eventual independence of Haiti, which is a, is a beacon of freedom to enslaved people across the Americas, but also to slave owners, uh, the symbol of, of black barbarism. And, uh, and we see in many ways an expansion of freedom across the board during this period, an explosion of the populations of free people of color, the Northern United States institutes gradual emancipation. Um, and, uh, and in all three of the places we're looking at, there's a rise in both manumission and suits for freedom. But it's as much uh, the unintended result of retrenchment and reform as of revolution. Slaveholding regimes that fear a cascading chain reaction of slave rebellion respond with retrenchment and reform. So in Cuba and in Spanish Louisiana, which had changed hands from the French in 1763, bourbon reforms meant to secure the slave system also make it possible for enslaved people to expand practices of coartacion and to consolidate the power of communities of free people of color. In Virginia, the legislature adopts new laws that are aimed at securing the slave system, for example, a ban on importation of slaves, but one that allowed hundreds of enslaved people to sue for freedom based on the fact that the penalty for importing uh, slaves against this ban was their emancipation. Um, one of the key avenues to, uh, for freedom suits in Virginia was to claim a non-Black Indian identity. So as freedom suits became easier to bring, people held in slavery pushed on that door as hard as they could, and they used one woman's freedom judgment as a wedge for dozens of family members to make claims based on an Indian foremother. And that avenue would grow in importance in early 19th century Virginia as other grounds for freedom claims are cut back, and it ties freedom to race, in a way that never happens in Cuba. So this is an example um, 
Nanny Peggy uh, made her claim for freedom to a Virginia Chancery Court. She based her claim on Indian ancestry. So that means lots of witnesses coming into court talking about her appearance, her hair, her reputation um, in the community um, and so on. Uh, she wins. Uh, jury awards her, in fact, uh, significant damages for being held wrongly in slavery and and sets her free and she wins at uh, every level of the court system. So like Juana, she used the law to win freedom for herself, uh, but she did so by disclaiming blackness. Um, you can see here uh, for, for the three jurisdictions over time, the significant uh, rise in po the populations of free people of color um, in uh, all the jurisdictions um, in, uh, in the age of revolution here in the, the late 18th and early uh, 19th century. And for a while, you might think that Virginia and Louisiana might build such substantial populations of free people of color uh, that they couldn't be cut back. Um, in all three cases, these populations, these communities complicated in, in important ways that association between blackness and enslavement that legislators were trying to enshrine in law. Um, but there was a key distinction. In Cuba and in Spanish Louisiana, many mission and the very existence of free communities of color are grounded on traditional understandings of slaveholding practices and black subjecthood. By contrast, in Virginia, in the New Republic, regulations about manumission, anxieties about the growing po population of free people of color become tangled up with debates about general emancipation and about citizenship in the New Republic. Um, the, the final period that we look at is this crucial um, period following uh, from about 1830 to 1860, where we mark the real shift in the fortunes of free people of color, the beginning of this, of this great divergence. So 1829, you have David Walker, a free man of color, publishing this incendiary pamphlet warning enslavers Unless you speedily alter your course, you and your country are gone. God Almighty will tear up the very face of the earth. Um, then in 1831, Nat Turner's rebellion in Virginia seemed to fulfill that prophecy, um, seizing arms and horses and killing 55 white people in their homes. Um, and of course, those scenes of rebellion um, and, and news of rebellion um, go across uh, Cuba and Louisiana as well. And the scale, in fact, of rebellions in Cuba during that period from 1812 to 1844 is, is much greater, in fact, than, than anywhere in the U.S. Um, all of this led slaveholders to fear uh, alliances of free people with the enslaved. And so, for example, when uh, white citizens of the eastern shore of Virginia and Northampton County um, petitioned the legislature for the removal of free people of color from their county. They warn of, quote, dangerous intrigues with our slaves. 1831 really marks the beginning of a legal onslaught against free people of color, efforts to remove them from states, send them to Africa or elsewhere, known as in the U.S. as colonization, restrictions of their movements, um, strict limits on manumission. In Cuba, there are some new restrictions placed on free people of color, but never to the same extent as in the U.S. Even colonization efforts focused only on the emancipados, slaves captured by the British Navy as part of its efforts to stop the illegal slave trade. In Louisiana, the most dramatic shifts in the fortunes of free people of color are only achieved in the 1850s, because Louisiana retained some elements of Spanish law and practice. Um, now in all three jurisdictions, slaveholding elites are seeking to police the color line. And in all of them, 
um, the new racist science is is circulating freely or, um, and influencing the defense of slavery. But it's really in the U.S. South where you have slaveholders articulating this coherent race-based defense of slavery as a positive good that marries biological racism to egalitarian democracy for white men in order to build up that solidarity between planters and non-slaveholders. So at the Virginia Reform Convention of 1850, they draw that link between white man's democracy and removal of free people of color. Um, as they explain, we are now about to enlarge the right of suffrage. It becomes more important that there not be a po that population among us. In other words, free people of color, free men of color who could claim citizenship. There's just not a parallel in Cuba to that association between white men's democracy and uh, slavery um, in the same way. Um, in Virginia, uh, where free people of color have to leave the state upon emancipation, that's, that's a, a powerful uncertainty in the lives of Virginians of color. Many stay in the state, but their situation becomes very precarious. They depend on white patrons for their security. They have to carry papers wherever they go. So the archives are filled with certificates of character signed by white neighbors, petitions to remain in the state, and in some cases, even so-called not a Negro certificates for which some free people of color petition the, the legislature um, to say, I am a free person of color, but I am not a Negro. Um, and, and most, I think, um, uh, heartbreaking and, and chilling in the uh, of the documents we found in the archives are these few petitions for re-enslavement for people whose only option to remain with family, to remain in their the land of their birth, um, once all of the laws are shutting down uh, the possibility of um, being a, a free person of color in the state are petitions for even for re-enslavement. Um, Louisiana uh, again changes hands to the U.S. in 1803, becomes a state in 1812, and the Americanization of Louisiana law includes the law of slavery. But the law, and, and in particular the legal knowledge of the community, um, remains influenced by Spanish traditions. Enslaved Louisianans retain the memory of Spanish legal practices and continue to make claims in Louisiana courts drawing on these traditions. Um, and I just give one example. This is a, a lawsuit brought by Francois against uh, Lebrano. He's a, a skilled hatter or hat maker. Um, and he says, we agreed on an $800 purchase price and essentially, he describes a coartacion contract. He says, I paid $500 towards my $800 price. And he says, therefore, I should own five-eighths of my labor. And that means that all of five-eighths of my wages should have gone towards my purchase price. And therefore, I have, I have completed my self-purchase. Um, and again, bringing a claim similar to that of Juanas of uh, you know, several centuries before, but in uh, American Louisiana, that claim had no chance. The Supreme Court of Louisiana said a slave cannot become partially free, um, although he, the court complimented his lawyer on the resources of his imagination and condemned Francois to the chain gang. So by 1860, we see a great divergence between Cuba on the one hand, Louisiana, and especially Virginia on the other, not in regimes of slavery, but of race. It was really the law of freedom, not of slavery, that determined uh, this racial legal regimes. The initiatives of enslaved people like Juana and Nanny and Francois were as important as legal traditions to this trajectory. 
They took advantage of legal reforms that were not intended for their benefit to carve out greater freedoms for themselves. And in that process, communities of free people of color are key. So although free people of color are few in number compared to enslaved people, the contests over their identity, status, and rights were the terrain on which race and racism and law were made. Laws regulating free people of color also served as a template for post-emancipation societies seeking ways to keep Black people in their place under uh, in Jim Crow laws and laws that limited the migration of free people of color from one state into the other or efforts to remove them entirely from the United States were the first immigration restrictions and they echo in limits on the right to immigrate based on race and national identity. That link created in law between citizenship and whiteness is the one that we still need to break. One question that I would pose to you is, um, were there any surprises while you were writing um, this book that came up? Goodness. We ended up writing such a different book from what we had initially in mind. Uh, we, had, we had imagined a book that was um, a comparative book on, um, on the law of slavery uh, in basically every aspect. Uh, I mean, we had a very, very ambitious, um, uh, we should have known better in retrospect, frankly. But um, we, we really didn't know where the book was going to go. I mean, what we did know was that we wanted to produce a new, uh, a new comparative study uh, that included and took advantage of all this new literature um, uh, that um, on legal slavery that has been produced across the Americas in the last few decades that we knew, and we had uh, we had a we had a vision by which we would compare several key areas, um, but of course the the guiding question still uh, was the old question was the question of how come these slave societies and we ended up choosing three societies which by the 19th century were mature slave societies, plantation slave societies. How come these societies had produced um, um, legal regimes concerning race? And that's where the disconnect was between kind of our initial impulse and, and the question. The question was always about differential um, racial regimes. And we thought we would find the answers to that question by looking comparatively at the law of slavery. But as Ariella mentioned, as we began to, as we began to look at the evidence of all these cases side by side, at some point, and maybe Ariella remembers the point, I don't, I don't, frankly, but at some point we realized that we needed to write a very different book, and a book that would actually concentrate not so much on the law of slavery but on the law of freedom and how, and on the, and on the links between blackness uh, and enslavement on the one hand, but also between blackness and freedom on the other. And that, and that led to, and that led to the book that we ended up writing, which, I mean, I think it's fair to say initially was not the book that we were thinking of, uh, of putting together. What do you think, Ariella? Yeah, that that's absolutely right. I was trying to remember uh, when that <laughs> when that was also. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we in some ways it became more focused over time. I, there were also, you know, just the the surprises in the archives. I mean, um, it, you know, what you find that that you don't necessarily expect to find. And, you know, there's been actually quite a lot of discussion um, in, here in the US lately about uh, 1619 and early Virginia and um, uh, how to characterize uh, the people who uh, were first brought here, the first 20, 
um, Africans brought to Virginia in 1619? Were they enslaved? Were they something else? Um, and, um, you know, although I, I would certainly answer that question by saying, yes, they were brought enslaved and there were a lot of assumptions about slavery brought with the slave trade, it was surprising to me to see um, when you went beyond some of the most commonly known um, pieces of evidence about early Virginia, but just spent more time in the in the county court records, um, the the kind of questions that were were left open and the kind of um, engagement with the law that was possible for uh, African descended people in the 17th century um, because it's so closed down afterwards. And uh, and I think beginning with that research is part of what what I convinced us how important the the long story of change over time was because so much of, of what's been written comparatively tends to be snapshots, um, whether of the end of, you know, the, the late antebellum part of slavery or of the very beginning and not of, of kind of the, the whole period. There's, um, there's a question here. Uh, it's a very good question um, saying you were both already very familiar with those three legal traditions before you started the empirical research for this book. Did you change somehow your idea about those three legal systems after reading your sources and writing the book? You know, the, the beauty of, uh, of, of comparative work is that it's how transformative it is. Um, because when you read about each of these legal regimes by itself, you don't ask, you ask other questions. You ask questions about change over time, you ask questions that are confined to the to to that legal tradition or to that legal system itself. But when you put the various uh, cases together, I think we ended up actually um, asking other questions because uh, they were the questions were grounded not on, on were grounded on, on not on the on the legal regime we knew best but on some other uh, some other example and then some of the some of the surprises to go back to Cecilia's point became clearer for instance you know uh, it, to me it was very clear that um, that the Iberians had a pretty clear sense of what it meant legally to be black by as early as the mid 16th century. Um, but the implications of that changed dramatically when we look at when we looked at it, for instance, side by side with Virginia, because suddenly what seemed like the natural thing or the, what seemed like the foregone conclusion was actually became a question. Why was it that some of the questions um, that the slaveholders and authorities, local authorities in Virginia were dealing with, were not even raised uh, in Iberian um, Havana, in, in, in Cuba, in the 16th century. Um, so that's a question that forces you to look differently at, at the Cuban case, but you look at it differently because you are asking a Virginia question to the Cuba case. And the other way around, then you begin to to notice how in places like Virginia and also in the French Caribbean, which informs the experience of Louisiana later, uh, the Iberian experience informs some of the solutions, some of the legal solutions that, that uh, evolved in Virginia during the 17th century. So by putting the cases together, you end up in fact, uh, and by doing primary research in each of the cases, which is something that we both did, uh, because I would send Ariella my material, and she would send me her material, and we would write. Uh, we we didn't write sections. It's not that I wrote the section on Cuba and Ariella wrote the section on Virginia. No, no. We would write. Each of us would write for the whole for all the cases, uh, and by doing that, I think we forced ourselves out of our comfort zones and forced ourselves to ask uh, questions which at least I had not asked before based on my previous readings and my previous research. Ariella? Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's that's definitely right. I I would say for me, um, the challenge, you know, what the well, I would say two things. One was I came to this book from uh, What Blood Won't Tell, which was a book that had really emphasized how much um, the United States uh, in the antebellum period in particular was not just uh, black and white um, and uh, how much um, people who were uh, in between enslaved and free, in between black and white are able to push on the law, um, push on, on legal institutions and um, and carve out often a place for themselves um, on this middle ground. And, um, and so if anything, I think I was expecting um, to find, you know, kind of more um, commonality and common ground. And, and I think in, in many respects, um, we did find, you know, there are many ways that we found that, that um, people were taking advantage of any opportunities available to them, um, ingenious, uh, right, uses of the legal system. And, um, and yet, um, for me, it was um, reckoning with uh, ultimately the, the key differences. So, for example, um, you know, I would have probably placed more emphasis before I started the work on this on all of the ways that um, free people of color and enslaved people made claims on citizenship right, um, in the antebellum era. Um, and after looking comparatively, I, I had to say, you know, yes, but with a lot more, a lot less room to to do so, um, and a lot and a much stronger political force shutting them down um, than was possible in Cuba. So I think that that the comparative aspect, you know, shifted my perspective um, to some extent. The other thing I was going to say is, you know, another place where we made a significant shift is in the periodization of the book. Right, that we um, ended up um, uh, really thinking about um, 1830 as a turning point, whereas we had assumed uh, when we first started out that that would be much earlier. And, and that was recognizing um, in, the, uh, in the Virginia case, for example, how long after the first limits on manumission and freedom suits, how long people continued the practices past when law changed on the books, um, and, and really how long that age of revolution went on um, a, a, around uh, the Americas. So, so I think we went through, you know, there are a number of places where we kind of challenged our own earlier assumptions. There was one, there was one thing that we, at least I was forced to, um, to think about carefully for the first time, um, you know, I had I, I had worked on manumission before, and I had written about manumission before, um, but I had never really asked the important question about why was it that manumission, the, the possibility for a slave owner to grant freedom. Um, on an enslaved person, which of course in practice me meant that the enslaved person would find ways to claim the freedom for herself or himself. I have never really examined the question of why that right, that window was not closed um, in, a, in a slave society that was otherwise brutal. And that by the 19th century was, uh, was probably one of the harshest slave societies in the Americas. Um, that's a question that if you only work on Cuba, as I had done uh, before, you don't even ask because you don't have to. You you are not you are not forced to deal with a question. 
by looking at these cases together, we were actually we were actually forced to deal with um, with that question quite carefully. And uh, I hope you'll notice the um, the problem with it. This is a negative question, right? This is something that did not happen. And, and then by looking at the other cases, you actually may wonder about that because it did happen in the other cases. So why not here? Why is it that despite a common effort to debase blackness, a common effort to legislate blackness, uh, to assimilate blackness with enslavement, why is it that you don't you don't find that in a place like Cuba and you find it in a place like uh, Louisiana or Virginia? So that's a question that uh, this it's another example uh, of a question that only comes up by looking at these cases uh, together side by side. That's the beauty of comparative work. Um, so I have, I see a question here. Can you say more about your argument that says freedom is more important than slavery in terms of forming racism? Um, and and I thank you for giving us a chance to uh, to expand and maybe clarify a little bit um, because I, I certainly don't want to don't want to. I don't. We wouldn't want to say that that slavery was not important in establishing racism in law or anywhere else. Um, but comparatively speaking, you know, and, and as a hunter alluded to, you have here three brutal plantation slave societies where um, the law of slavery um, across all of them is. Uh, working to, um, you know, keep people enslaved and uh, and um, punish infractions against uh, the system and quell rebellion and um, and keep the the or the slave order um, with relatively little variation. Um, where where um, where regimes of race. Um, really come in both in terms of of drawing the boundaries between um, racial categories um, and uh, and determining um, what status would attach to blackness. It's the the differentiation among free people, not between free and enslaved, that that really um, determines that, right? It's it's will it become possible to become free, and when free, um, would it will it be possible for a black person to become a part of public life, to um, to exercise rights, to marry, to um, participate in public institutions, and um, and those are also the questions that carry over into a post-emancipation society. Those are the questions: Will a black person um, be able to participate in public life? Those are still the questions, in some sense, um, that we that we're dealing with when we're when we're thinking about racism in in law. I don't know if you wanna. So, so in each of these cases, of course, slavery is absolutely central. I, I mean, I'm going to second uh, strongly what Ariella just said, because the whole point precisely is to align uh, blackness with enslavement. But the, the problem is when that alignment is broken, is, is that legally and politically possible? Is black freedom legally and politically possible? And, and that's... And that, is what we, that's where our research pushed us. We began with, uh, with slavery. We began just with slavery. We were, that, that was really our starting point precisely because in every legal regime we were examining, um, um, the, the impulse was to, was to assimilate blackness with enslavement. Uh, but we quickly realized uh, that in order to understand the social meanings and the social implications of blackness by the mid 19th century, we had to look at the question of, of black freedom. We had to look at, at the very possibility of crossing 
um, of crossing that barrier that had been built in legal regimes in, in the three jurisdictions since the 16th century, by which mean by which black meant black, negro, noir meant enslavement, meant slavery. Um, so that's it is in that sense that we ended up thinking that the, the law of freedom and not the law of slavery was more important uh, to understand those differences. Um, I see uh, uh, one more question. Is there a connection between the legal regime that allowed blacks to claim indigenous identity in the colonial and antebellum period to the erasure of indigenous identity under Jim Crow, certainly in Virginia, but to some degree in the other two cases? Um, uh, so uh, also a great question, and I would say definitely yes, um, although I think it's a somewhat complicated relationship. I, I think an indigenous identity in legal terms um, is was often uh, erased through being uh, subsumed into um, black identity in uh, censuses and uh, and in and in legal categories in uh, southeastern states like Virginia, um, be in the sense that anyone with mixed ancestry, whether individuals or communities, um, would in the category people of color. Um, if there was any uh, any part of that was African descended, they would be um, port often portrayed as uh, you know go into uh, the black category or or at least the category of free people of color, and um, and so on the other hand, um, uh, because Indians. Um, uh, you know, because from the uh, late 18th century on, U.S. courts say that Indians cannot be enslaved legally, um, that's an avenue for anyone who with potentially mixed ancestry to claim Indian identity as a basis for freedom. And uh, and so many um, uh enslaved people who may have been originally part of an indigenous community that at the time was legally enslaved, they or they may very likely have had um, mixed ancestry of both indigenous and, and African descended. Um, if there's a credible, you know, if they're able to make a claim to an, a, an Indian ancestor in the maternal line, that's a route to freedom. And, uh, and so um, it's not surprising how many, you know, how many African descended peoples will be, will be um, trying to make a claim that some connection to um, an indigenous ancestor. Um, but uh, but it's more um, complicated, right, to say, well, um, in from the the white legal perspective, once any indigenous community is you know tainted with um, a connection to um, people of African descent, they're no longer really Indian. Um, uh, but it, but they don't only go in in that direction. Actually, in in what blood won't tell, I write about you know a number of of communities that that take very different routes after after the Civil War into white identity, into Indian identity, or into um, uh, you know trying to claim some kind of multiracial identity. Thank you.